Sure. Thank you, Corrine. And thank you to everyone for um, being your interest in my favorite topic. Um, so I've worked in technology industry, uh, sales and marketing for close to four decades. Um, that's, that's hard to admit. <laughs> don't know why I say that and then still color my hair, but anyway, <laughs> I, fine. <laughs> yeah. And I, because I have a background in really sales and marketing, I understand, I know that salespeople are effective with persuading one buyer at a time because they have this ability in that moment or moments or months or however long it takes to win a business to listen to what the buyers want and then use what the buyers want to be able to craft a, a messaging you know, on the spot, a proposal, a presentation that buyers will say, oh, that's a perfect match with my needs. In marketing, where we don't have that privilege uh, and we don't get to listen to buyers. And this is a real handicap. And so we make step up, frankly, you know, I don't know how that's going to translate to French, but um, that's, you know. we use that too. <laughs> yeah, we, we, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll even use, you know, we make shit up, you know, we go around just like, <laughs> having to come up with a message strategy and a marketing strategy without that precious advantage of knowing how that matches what the buyers want. And so I built this methodology after leading, I used to lead a workshop for pragmatic marketing. That was a two day class on product marketing. And in it, I had an hour on buyer personas. And at the end of the class, people would say, oh, that was the best part and we want more. And so that was really the incentive for starting this company and, and writing a book and, and just helping people really understand how can we as marketers understand what a market full of buyers wants so that we have that same advantage as salespeople could understand one buyer at a time, because that's really the difference. Sales mm -hmm. is persuade one buyer at a time. Marketing is persuade a market full of buyers, which is harder. I'm going to say the reason marketing's harder is because we don't get to listen first. So I'm like, oh, let's create a way for marketers to listen first. Good question, Karine. So um, yeah, because there is this, I'll take the science part first since you asked the question in that order. So the science is that there's just a few things that we specifically want to know about buyers. And there's a lot of confusion around this. People think, ah, oh, you know, we should know um, whether they are married and have children and whether they have a dog or a cat or go to yoga after work. And, you know, that's not the, science, the good science because what we need to know is what do the buyers expect from our company before they choose would choose to do business with us. And so the science part is understanding five things. First of all, what triggers the buyer's investment in this category, in a solution like ours, in a product like ours, in a service like ours? The second is understanding how the buyers define success. Whatever they're buying, it, what do they have to believe will be better once they buy this? And it, essentially these are the benefits, but it's from the buyer's perspective. Mm -hmm. the, the third part of the science is understanding what their objections are, what, what keeps them from making a buying decision or, and or what keeps them from choosing us? Why do they sometimes choose another approach or a competitor rather than us? The fourth part of the science is understanding their decision criteria. These are all the questions buyers ask as they make this decision. What do they, these are the things that we need to be talking about in our marketing content and that our salespeople need to know how to talk about in sufficient detail that the buyer says, oh yeah, I, I, I trust this company. You know, they can, they answer my questions. They understand what I need. And then the fifth part, of the buyer persona is the buyer's journey. So for this buying decision, for this decision that we want them to make to buy from us, what is their journey here? 
Who do they trust? What are the steps they take? Um, who's involved in that decision? All of that needs to be factored into the buyer's journey and it's specific to the decision we want them to make. So that's the science part. Wow. The art part is that is really how we capture that information mm -hmm. um, and how we analyze that information so that we can see patterns. Because um, you know, in order to have a persona, we have to understand, I just said a few minutes ago, a market full of buyers. So there's some art involved in discovering the answers to those five questions and also in then analyzing it and saying, oh, okay, this is the part that is consistent, you know, across buyers. Because it's easy to see what's different between different buyers. It's maybe something that we're not as used to doing. And that's what salespeople do because salespeople are dealing with one customer at a time. And if you ask your salespeople, they'll often talk about what's unique because they're not patterns people. That's not what they're paid to do. They're paid to treat each buyer as unique. What we have to do, and it's, it is an art, is, is find a way to create a pattern around that so that we can apply that to the market. Yeah, so the, we could ask, are they per industry? We could ask, are they per role in, in the buying decision? We could ask, are they per geography? Okay. And I know you guys are in France, but are they different in the UK? Or are they different in Singapore? I mean, we could ask, are they different based on company size? If we're selling B2B, okay. are they different based on company size? So okay. all of those are valid questions. And those are questions that this, that our approach to buyer personas ultimately answers. Um, because when we look at, when we interview customers or buyers rather, to understand, you know, those five categories of insight that I mentioned here as the science part, we can look for differences. And if they're different by industry, then we learn that from the, what the buyers are saying. If they're different by geography, if they're different by role, if they're different by company size, those are really the four potential places they're different. What I can tell you, because you know we have the benefit of having done this for work for 150 clients and across every part of the globe and a part across every size company, across every kind of buying decision you can think of, is that industry. Up until COVID, industry was rarely important as a differentiator for buyer personas. Um, COVID changed that a little bit because some industries were really severely affected in a negative way by COVID and other industries are thriving because of COVID. And then there's that great middle part, which is kind of like, oh, you know, didn't really change much for us. And so now industry can be a different way to think about that. But I would tell you that that's probably pretty obvious to you. You don't have to do a lot of research to know that. I mean, we all know which industries were most for, negative. For now, for sure. So, and the other surprising thing, especially for you guys in, in France, is that geography, while it does change the differences in some of the way people think, in, in based on France versus, I don't know, Quebec, you know, we, we do a lot of work for Canada and is Quebec different than, you know, in, um, you know, some of the folks that are in uh, British Columbia um, in Canada. And that you can find differences, but you can also find so much that they have in common that you, and, and here's what I always tell people, because it's easy to get too many personas. And this is a big hazard. It's a that's, big risk. The most dangerous thing risk. you can do. Yeah. And so I always tell people, instead of searching and searching for what's different based on industry, geography, company size or role, search for what they have in common. Mm -hmm. Because here's the rule you can for sure write down. You should never, ever have more personas then you have capacity to go to market. That's a very good one. 
if you can't afford to build two completely separate marketing strategies for two different industries, you should not have two different personas. You could, should find out what those people have in common because ultimately this work is not about having personas. This work is about having effective marketing strategies. I love and that. People, people get caught up in this, you know? And I mean, a, a, a client we just started working with, they had 135 personas. 135. Now, How you know, do you this, is, that? They, this is a $4 billion company in the US. So they are a big company. But okay. still, this is patently absurd. There is no value in having that many personas. And so our work is to help them get down to, I don't know, four, five, maybe. Oh, wow. And you did that's that? How, that's how many ways they have capacity to go to market. And I, I just like to always, I never want to get through a conversation like this where I have an audience listening to me without saying that. You don't want more personas. And the, the way to that, achieve that is to look for what they have in common instead of what they have that's different. Obviously, that's what the whole book is about, is how you interview people and analyze the data and get it into those five categories. So I'll try to give you a short answer, and then we can go as deep on this as you feel, as you want uh -huh. to, given the time question of each step of the but book. But the short answer is, don't pay attention to anything about the persona that doesn't fall in one of those five categories. They're buying triggers, they're out the success they're seeking, their objections, the questions they're asked, we call that decision criteria and their journey. Don't look at anything else about them. If you bring in any other aspects of the persona, you will have too many. So that's the first answer to get pure. And the second answer is to look for what they have in common in each of those areas. You say that. Stop yeah. thinking, because we have to always recall that in marketing, we cannot, it, it, we can have to influence a market full of buyers. We have to find how we can credibly and affordably and efficiently say something that will appeal to all those different people. Mm -hmm. And then, if there's a part of the buyer journey that where they have to get one-on-one -on -one information, that's sales's job. That's a different job. Okay. Yeah. And and so, you know, we we've got to keep this your what Mark was saying, and I love Mark Schaefer because he's so um oh, he's so enraged all the time. You know, I love his rage. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great one. I'm gonna tell him that. <laughs> yeah. I love the way he's always like, because, you know, in order to create change, you often have to go up against mm. what's, you know, what's become the established pattern. Like, here's mine. You want to hear what my, I get enraged about? And I rant on this all the time is stop talking about benefits. So marketing is all about, you know, and I mean, I, I, I grew up, I started buying computers in the 70s, in 1970, for when I worked for a big bank. And I grew up in the tech industry when nobody on the planet cared about what a computer was and certainly didn't carry one around in their hand. Mm -hmm. So I know where we got into this trap of, oh, we can only, we can't talk about anything in detail. Plus it was before the internet. So people, you know, they couldn't go research things on their own. But nowadays, by the time a buyer is engaged with your company's marketing, I'm talking to everybody on this call today, they already know the benefits of your solution. Of course, that's it's what the, you mentioned in your book. And they are the same. And the buyers perceive the benefits as the same for every single company they're evaluating. Okay. So please, please stop talking about benefits. And please yeah. start talking about why they should trust you the most to deliver those benefits, which is all about the questions they have, which guess what? Actually, oh God, I can't believe she's going to say this, gets into features. Oh, I, I call them capabilities to make it a little less, a little more palatable to people. But, you know, this is, this is my rant because we interview buyers every day and every single one of them 
knows all the benefits of our client solution and every other competitor's solution. And they all say to us, they're all the same. So differentiating yourself around the benefits you can deliver is a lost cause. You are not going to do that. You must differentiate yourself by proving that you, among everybody on the planet, is best qualified to overcome their objections, to, to, to you know, take away their worry about what could go wrong, and assure them that you are qualified to deliver those benefits. Yeah, so nobody really knows for sure. So if you if you read Alan Cooper's book carefully, you'll see him talking about marketing personas mm -hmm. in just a couple of places. Um, but if you you know all the, all work gets embedded in the context of people who have a problem, and I love Alan Cooper's "The Inmates Are Running the Asylum" because he was really grappling with how to get teams to build products that people would want to use, you know? And, you know, this, this was in 1990 when technology was just horrible to use. So he was trying to figure that out and he came up, he really just sort of like out of that deep inquiry invented this idea of user personas to help developers understand how people wanted to use their products. And he refers a little bit in there to this idea of marketing personas but only in, by way of saying that isn't what this is. But then, you know, you know, I wish I could tell you when I first heard, I didn't invent the term buyer persona. I'm not even sure when I first heard the term, but I always, because it always feels like I just knew about this idea that we, that a, there's a user persona that tells you how people want to use your product. And there's a buyer persona that tells you how people want to buy your product. And those are very, very distinct things. It's very but nobody, nobody had ever really, the reason I wrote my book, which was the worst year of my life, I never wanted to write a book. I hated writing the book. I hated every minute of it. But I felt compelled to um, lay down the rules for what a buyer persona should be because nobody had done it. And there, I mean, it makes me crazy to Google what is a buyer persona and have pop up, you know, that it's a fictional or even semi-fictional depiction of a buyer because, oh my gosh, that makes me crazy. Why would anybody build a strategy around fiction? <laughs> and this is and really, that's what they're, I and I said, that's yeah. really has became that. Yeah, you have nice design and, and cute faces. And but this it's is fictional. Like, Let's Let's yeah. just go build a strategy for Harry Potter while we're at it. <laughs> I mean, you know, honestly, it just makes no sense to me that anybody on the world would build any kind of a business strategy and invest money based on fictional or even semi-fictional anything. So I had to go write a book about it. it, it like, and I'm glad I did it, but it was horrible. I, I never wanted to write a book. It was awful. <laughs> Well, you're, you're only talking about triggers now, which is only one of the five areas. Of yeah, 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 yeah. But, but if you, it's just around triggers, I want you to find um, an expert, ideally talking to a buyer themselves. Okay. That's what you really want to do. And ask this one question. Take me back to the day when you first decided you needed something like and X is something in your category. It's not your product name. It's when, take me back to the day when you first decided. You know, sometimes I, I like to say some of, you know, the best people to do these interviews are journalists. Because this is not like traditional mark. You don't need to be a researcher. This is more like journalism. We're trying to capture from people who have recently made the decision. We want to capture their story. And so we start at the beginning of their story. You know, take me back to the day when you, at the beginning of this journey, if you're talking about traditional research, there's basically quantitative research, which is surveys and gives you statistical validity. And there's qualitative research, which is focus groups and interviews. So this is in the qualitative category. Okay. And all, all that I've done is propose a different way of doing those interviews where instead of building a discussion guide or a script, 
and asking people to think about something or and coming up with the questions that we want to have answered. We instead find people who have just made the decision and we ask them to tell their story. So, you know, my, my gripe with traditional approaches to research is that it tends to be structured around things that we as the marketer want to know. So we built, you know, I mean, the worst example is a survey. We build the questions, we make up the questions, and then we make up the answers and we ask people to choose between them. I mean, this is, this is great. This is a great way to validate what we know, but it's a terrible way to learn something we don't know because we made up the answers, we biased the results. And even a discussion guide with interviews biases the results. Okay. So I'm so my method that was the unique, really, and that yeah, some professors around the the um, internationally are using for to teach classes for research is let's not you build a discussion guide at all let's not have a script mm -hmm. let's just find people and this is key who have recently made the buying decision we want to understand and ask them take me back to the day when you first decided and that you needed this and then walk them through everything they did and thought about through their entire journey all the questions they asked all the concerns they had all the things they didn't like and did like and and ultimately we record those interviews and transcribe them and look for patterns and that's our percentage. So first of all, for people that are on startups, I always remind them that people, that you are trying to solve a problem that people have been solving either by buying from someone else until now or by doing it some other way, that people have been spending time, energy and money to solve the problem you solved. Those are the people you want to interview. Okay, that's a great list. It's people who, and ideally spent money. So I always talk about the Apple Watch. We didn't do work for them, but when Apple launched the Apple Watch, they couldn't interview customers of smartwatches. So we would have interviewed people who bought in the last year an iPhone and a Fitbit because those people were trying to solve the problem that the Apple Watch solved. So we could understand the goals, the, the triggers, the outcomes they needed, the decision criteria they had. And then at the end of the interview, we could test our value. And so this is an add-on to, to our interview where we say, oh, okay, so now what if instead of buying an iPhone and a Fitbit, you know, you had a watch that would tap you on the wrist when you got a text and how would that affect it? So these don't have to be your customers and they don't even, even if you think you've invented something brand new, then the objective is interview people who have been spending money to solve that problem another way. Abs it's it, every single thing. It's the SEO strategy. You couldn't name anything in marketing that isn't improved by having verbatim quotes from real buyers listening to their words for how they describe that absolutely for SEO and keywords and all of that. Well, that's a very good question, Kareem. So I always say that at the root of it, we're trying to understand people making decisions. And, and a buying decision is a very discreet decision where there's an exchange of money, right? But there's actually something more valuable that buyers have and that's their time. And when they decide to spend time reading your blog, then you can ask them, take me back to the day when you first decided to start reading my blog and tell me what got you interested in that? What was, what, tell me what happened? What was the, you know, event or experience or whatever that really got that to be compelling for you? And then you can do that around your competitors' blogs. You know, if you can find it, of course, finding these people at interviews was probably the hardest part of this, but. If you somehow have access to people that are reading the blogs that you want, people, those same audiences to come and read your blog, then it's asking them, you know, take me back to the day when you first started doing this, reading this blog. Because, and for a lot of people, their time is even more valuable than money. And so if you bake it down to, we want to understand decisions 
then you can extrapolate or you can leverage this methodology for other things other than buying decisions. Okay. Ten, if you can. I mean, it don't, the main thing is not more than ten. I mean, you'll get learn a lot from five or six. Okay. Um, but people think because research tends to be, oh, you know, fifty percent of people say this, and seventy-five, and then there's like thousands of people involved. Well, that's quantitative research, and this is qualitative, and it's really the quality of the interviews. It's it's much less about how many, but. We found that we found because we do this all day long, you know, I have 15 people that work for me that this is what they do all day, that tends about that place where there's like, you'll get more and more and more and more information. It keeps going up. And then after 10 interviews, it's like you're starting to hear the same thing all the time. So the value of doing more than 10 is really marginal. Well, that's a hard question to answer because um, we are the, probably the most expensive service to do this but we do have clients we just did an analysis you know most of our clients have are 100 million annually in revenue and up but we've we've done work for companies as small as 10 million in revenue okay. um so but you know it's gonna this is getting a professional company to do this is going to depend a lot on their approach the the main reason our work is so expensive is that we never work from our client's customer list. We find people on our own and the, the re interviews we do are double blind. So nobody ever knows how who our client is. And that allows us to interview competitors, customers, and, and, and people aren't biased during the interviews by knowing who our client is. So it's, it's very expensive. It is, it is if you have time. Um, you know, what I, what I tell people, because usually, usually when you're a marketer, I trust me, I've, you know, I've, I've owned a couple of companies. I've been a CMO in smaller companies. Really hard. And this is time consuming. Even if it's only 10 interviews, finding those people in interviews, scheduling them, analyzing the data. Um, go to your local university and um, see, um, you know, I'm not that familiar with the universities in France, but you have this idea of people that, yeah, that, that do work for companies like during the summer, like mm -hmm. just to get experience, to get job experience, have them read my book. I'm sorry, it's not translated in French. Mm -hmm. So find a local university student who wants to, you know, work. Um, and, you know, you need somebody in journalism, especially. Oh, because a, journalists are people who think like journalists understand getting to the root of the story, like asking good follow-up questions, because that's really where the art of this interview is, is not just reading questions from a script, but, oh, so you say you, you wanted something easy to use. What did you mean by easy to use? How did you know which was easiest to use? What is, how much training do you need before it's easy to use? You know, really getting people to elaborate, the people you're interviewing to elaborate. And journalism students are ideal. And these people need the work. I mean, in the US, sometimes we don't even have to pay these students. They just want the work. I mean, I, I, I'm a content marketer. I think it's all about starting a blog, having the, getting the content out there. Um, it's, it's definitely not about any paid anything, no paid advertising, no paid, you know, 15,000, you can't buy enough paid anything to make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about, and, and it's, then it's also about um, influencer marketing, you know, finding influencers in your category who will help you get the message out. Um, but I wouldn't spend a dime. I mean, you have to have a website. So, you know, somehow or another, that's got to get factored into your budget because you have to have a place for people to go to get the content. And, Website yeah, us. because I do think, I mean, I'm, a, I'm with Joe Pulitzi on this. I'm sure you interview him. You really need an owned platform. Um, the social platforms are all, except for LinkedIn, they're all, even LinkedIn starting to deteriorate a little bit, but most of the social platforms are really getting run, uh, sadly, okay. because they, they had a place, but like a lot of technologies, you know, as soon as anything gets good, then we find a way to ruin it, right, Kareen? <laughs>